What does Paul mean when he says he handed someone over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh? Well, last week I was in a conversation with a few fellow believers, and one of them actually warned me, or I think warned me, that if we sin too much, God will eventually take us home early. And I challenged him on that, and I said, look, I'm not familiar with that teaching. Can you show me the scripture from where you're getting that? And he did. He shared with me a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me read it to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So what this gentleman did is he said, so what God will do is he'll kill you off because you can't stop sinning, but he'll take you home. You'll be saved. And and he presented that as a good thing. So I didn't really rebuttal it much then. I was just like, okay, well, I've, I've heard that before, actually. But I wanted to do a little micro study on, on it and then just really dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 so we can understand what that means. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. So first of all, let's, let's build a profile for this gentleman who's being discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, okay? Let's just pull out some attributes and um, just see what, what he's involved in and why would Paul say something like this about him. So the first thing is, He's committing a sexual immorality, and it's something that pagans don't tolerate. So you know it's really, 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 really bad. And that's how Paul opens this chapter. It's really, really bad. And he goes on to tell you that this gentleman is having a sexual affair with his father's wife. Now, at best, this is his stepmother. At worst, it's his actual mother. Either way, really, 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 really bad. And that is why Paul is rebuking this, okay? So to go on a little bit, I want to just pull out some of the words Paul uses to describe this gentleman, okay? He says he's malicious, he's wicked, and he is a so-called brother, uh, someone who claims to be a believer. Some versions say it like that, a so-called brother. So many of the problems with this chapter is that we wrongly interpret this and say that this is a Christian in the church that has got involved in this horrible thing, and now this is an episode of church discipline. That is not at all what's happening here. He is a so-called brother. He is someone who claims to be a believer. He is not a believer. We know this because Paul actually, he says it flat out to us when he says so-called brother or claims to be a believer, but he also gives us a metaphor about it and he illustrates this for us, okay? And anyone who would be familiar with the Old Testament scriptures, so a Jewish audience, would know exactly what he's talking about here. He brings up the Passover, and he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, so let's celebrate the feast, the feast of unleavened bread that follows the Passover, with the new bread, the unleavened bread, not not mixing in the old leaven. But let me read you the scripture when he says that, because he's very deliberate with his wordings of these two types of bread, because he actually presents two types of bread, leavened and unleavened. And leaven, by the way, is just yeast. Some versions will just say yeast. I have New American Standard. It actually says leaven. So he says here, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? A little yeast makes the entire lump of dough rise. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What he's saying there is clean out the old leaven, get rid of that, the wickedness, the malice, the malice, because you are already this new lump. You are the unleavened bread. Not try to be. You are. Why? Because the sacrifice has already happened. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You are the unleavened bread. So don't associate with leaven. And now they're, met, they're, met, they're metaphors. So he's saying you are, you are one way. You are a believer. So don't associate with unbelievers. Now, you have to be very careful with that because he goes on to tell you exactly what he means by that. Not general unbelievers, not people who don't claim to be believers, not people who are outside of the church, specifically with people who claim to be believers, but are unbelievers. Those are the ones he tells you not to associate with. He says, I would never tell you not to associate with unbelievers. You'd have to leave the entire world. There's no way you could do that. I'm saying don't associate with people who claim to be believers, but are not. So, Kind of in summation, the gentleman who is mentioned here is not a believer. He's someone who claims to be. He is the he is the leavened dough in, in the metaphor. He's someone who claims to be something, but he isn't. But that still leaves us the question, okay, great, but what does that mean to hand him over to Satan? Well, you might be interested uh, to to find out, or maybe perhaps you already know, that that actually shows up again in Scripture. It shows up twice. So it shows up here, and then it also shows up in 1 Timothy. So let's visit that 
because that's going to help us understand this a little bit better too. There's a gentleman in 1 Timothy, and he also shows up in 2 Timothy, and he's somebody that Paul really wants to make clear that this guy is a false teacher. He's a false teacher, he's not a believer, and he's somebody that's doing a great deal of damage. And his name is Hymenaeus. Hymenaeus. Say that three times fast. So in verse 19 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, Paul is going to begin to speak about this Hymenaeus. And this is what he says. Keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. I have handed them over to Satan. Exactly what he said about the gentleman in 1 Corinthians. I have handed him over to Satan. Okay, to be taught not to blaspheme. What is blasphemy? Well, a lot of times when we think of blasphemy, we think of taking the Lord's name in vain, you know, saying something like GD or Jesus Christ is an expression or something like that. But that's not really how scripture defines it. Blasphemy is unbelief. It is the unforgivable sin. It is blasphemy of the spirit, rejecting the Holy Spirit, rejecting Christ. Blasphemy is unbelief. So when he's assigning that to this Hymenaeus and then Alexander, but let's really focus on Hymenaeus because he's going to show up again. When he's saying, I've handed them over to Satan so they would be taught not to blaspheme, he's being very deliberate. Unbelief. That's what he's speaking of. Now, you can actually just go back a few verses and prove that right here. When Paul is describing his former way of life before he had that encounter on the road to Damascus, he refers to himself as a blasphemer. Let me read that to you. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me, me to be faithful, putting me into his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly and in unbelief. Ignorantly and unbelief. I was an unbeliever, and this is why I did what I did. And he's saying that, and then he's assigning that same word to Hymenaeus here. He's saying he's a blasphemer. He's still on the road to Damascus. He hasn't had the encounter with Christ yet. He's still there. Okay? So, and then he says he's handed him over to Satan, so he'd be taught not to blaspheme. We're going to fast forward here in a second, but I want to point something out really quick. Satan doesn't teach anyone not to blaspheme. He loves blasphemers. He's the original blasphemer. Okay? Unbelief. Yeah, he's not teaching anyone not to not to unbelieve because what would be the result of that? They would become a believer. They would believe in Christ. That's exactly what he's opposed to. So he's not teaching anyone not to blaspheme. So there must be something else that means. That can't be the context. Handing him over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme can't be the context. So, and, and likewise, Satan isn't destroying anyone's flesh so that their spirit can be saved. He's not going to do that. He's not going to participate with anything that involves you being saved. He's not going to participate and he's not going to help. He's, he's not going to do that. So again, what on earth does this mean? <laughs> so we keep going. So in 2 Timothy, and this is in 2 Timothy, Hymenaeus shows up again. So here he comes again. And this is how he is spoken of in 2 Timothy. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among the, them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying the resurrection has already taken place and they're jeopardizing the faith of some. Okay, so here they show up again, and he's saying, not only, who, who knows what they were doing in, back when he wrote 1 Timothy, they were blaspheming, they're speaking out of ignorance and unbelief. But now they're saying the resurrection is already happening and they're jeopardizing people's faith. So they're, they're furthering this destruction because they're in unbelief. So to jump down a little bit here, I think we get our definition of what it means to be handed over to Satan, to be taught not to blaspheme for the destruction of the flesh. I think this really gives us that answer. So he says right here, and he's talking about, he's speaking to Timothy and saying, and this is how you should conduct yourself. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That's what I think it means. So when you're when Paul's saying, I'm handing this person over to Satan, he's saying, I'm recognizing where this person's at. 
And I'm not going to be, you know, he's rebuking the Corinthian church for being proud in the midst of having this go on among them. And he's saying, that's wrong. We need to separate ourselves from that. Leave him be. Recognize where he's at. He, Paul doesn't hand anyone over to Satan. We can't do that. We don't hand people over to Satan as Christians. They may already be, as it says right here, they're already held captive by him. They've been taken captive by him to do his will. Unbelievers have. So we're not handing to Satan what is already in his possession. When Paul says that, he's saying, I'm, I'm letting everyone know where this person's at. Corinthians, you need to rebuke this person. When you're all assembled, you need to rebuke this behavior, telling everybody, teaching everybody where this person's at. This is wrong, what's going on here. He's saying that about Hymenaeus. This is wrong. He's jeopardizing the faith. He, he himself has suffered shipwreck, according to his faith. Shipwreck means you sink. He suffered that. And now he's jeopardizing the faith of other people. He is speaking from ignorance and, and from unbelief recognize that and i think that that's what he's saying so he's saying i and we don't know with um with you know timothy was was at ephesus we don't know if paul in an additional letter or somehow or another had actually made made a statement about hymenaeus to the to the church at ephesus we don't know that he's making one to timothy here but i think he probably would have because that's what he's instructing the corinthians to do is let everybody, everybody needs to come together and recognize where this person's at. Hand them over to Satan. Essentially, leave them be, but separate from them because they're claiming to be a believer and they can jeopardize the faith of some. So it's destructive. So that's, that's my thoughts on that. That's what I believe that means. Again, we know what it can't mean. It can't mean the literal interpretation. Satan doesn't teach people not to blaspheme and he doesn't help people come to a knowledge of the truth. He's the anti of that. So it can't be that. And it certainly isn't God taking people home early. So what, what would that mean? It would mean that there's there's still a sin problem. I mean, it goes right back to that. And that's the problem with sin-centered theology versus Christ-centered theology. Sin-centered theology, it's all about sin. There is still a sin problem, even though you have Jesus Christ. That's the sword they always fall on. And, and you have to have first accepted that in order to get this interpretation to where this is, this is a Christian who's just been lost in sin and now God's going to kill them. You have to have first accepted all kinds of other bad teachings to get to that point. So those are my thoughts on it. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Um, you can always contact me too at thewayministries.net. Just uh, go jump over to the contact tab. You can shoot me an email. My name is Jeremiah. I appreciate it, guys. Have a good one.